our merciful and compassionate Father in heaven, before your throne of grace, we gather this evening as this prophecy school. We do worship you and praise your name. We thank you for seeing us safely through this day, for the safe journeys we have made to this place. And this evening, we do pray that your Holy Spirit will continue to abide in each of our hearts and in our midst. We do acknowledge, apart from you, we are weak, erring, and sinful. We do rely upon you, the Lord, our strength, our righteousness, and our salvation. We pray, Father, for this prophecy school. May we develop a love for your truth. May we also review our own lives because we do see our greatest and most urgent need for a revival. Pray, Father, that you will help us all to make our calling and election sure, especially as we live in the last days of this his Earth's history. Pray for each one here. You know each one of us individually. You know our needs. Pray, Father, that you will please draw near to bless, comfort, and strengthen each of us. We also pray for the families that we represent, wherever we, we may be, and for our church at large and in our hometown. Pray, Father, tonight for the opening of this session. Bless the speaker as he presents your message. We commit ourselves anew to your care and pray for your continued watch care and protection. For these blessings, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Good evening. Um, we're going to begin with some of the foundation um, principles of the Prophecy School. And uh, you see on title, Context, Principles, Purposes, and Design. I don't know if uh, we'll touch all those directly, but those encompass um, pretty much uh, the first few presentations this evening and tomorrow. And we begin with Second Chronicles 2020. Um, first time, first time I've worked off PowerPoint, so I'm I'm having to make a decision now. I, do I open my Bible and read from my Bible, or do I read it off the screen? So, um, and you may be making that decision as well. Do you look to the screen, or do you look to your Bible? And my first impression is, is that you ought to be looking in your Bible when we go to the Bible text. The Spirit of Prophecy quotes probably the screen, maybe your notes. But let's read the first one together. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall you prosper. So shall you be established. Believe his prophets, so shall you prosper. Um, I believe that that's what God's people need today is a, a, a firm confidence in the prophetic word and I think at some point along the line in Adventism um, we lost sight of the role and purpose of prophecy and the revival that we need that was in the prayer and the opening song um, I believe comes from Bible prophecy and that's what we're going to begin to look at tonight. Our first text is one that uh, we deal with um, a great deal in Future for America. Se Selected Messages, Book 1, page 121. A revival of true godliness among us is the most, is among us is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs. To seek this should be our first work. Um, I'm sure we've read that passage in the book, and if you remember, in that same passage, just seven pages later, um, Sister White identifies that a revival, revival symbolizes a renewal of spiritual life. If our greatest need in our first work is to seek for a revival, it means that our greatest need is to come back to life because we are spiritually dead. That is the condition of God's people portrayed in Bible prophecy at the end of the world in a variety of places. And in Adventism today, we, those of us that are worried about how we are revived, we have a lot of different ideas on how we we 
believe the Lord is going to revive his people, but I submit to you that the, the, the mode that the Lord has identified that he brings his people into revival experience is through prophecy. Now, the, 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 the largest argument you get to that statement, and you get an argument to that statement in, in Adventism is that the message of Adventism that we need now is the 1888 message, ri the righteousness of Christ. And brothers and sisters, I submit to you that that isn't the message for Adventism today. That's the experience that Adventism needs. They need that experience because we're dead. And the Lord identifies that the way that he awakens us so that we might obtain that experience is through the prophetic word. Um... The next quote is the one I referred to that seven pages later, revival signifies a renewal of spiritual life, a quickening of the powers of the mind and heart, a resurrection from spiritual death. I think the greatest uh, obstacle from us entering into this spiritual resurrection is our willingness to admit that that is our condition. Um, especially here in the United States. We have a lot of reasons to avoid that subject. But brothers and sisters, Bible prophecy is clear. Um, look at I, Ezekiel 37. God's people at the end of the world are a valley of dead, dry bones. And uh, they need to be awakened to become the, the mighty army at the end of time. In Testimonies to Ministers, page 113, it says, we, when we as a people understand what this book means to us, and if you read that passage, she is speaking about the books of Daniel and Revelation, and here she says, when we understand what this book means to us, this is consistent with what Sister White says, the books of Daniel and Revelation are the same book. She says they go together, they complement one another. Um, so she's saying, when we understand, when we as a people understand what Daniel and Revelation means to us, there will be seen among us a great revival. And I submit to you that it's not when we come to memorize the books of Daniel and Revelation that there will be a revival. I submit to you that there is a piece of information in the books of Daniel and Revelation that has been designed by God to bring a revival. And it's going to parallel uh, a piece of information that the Millerites came to understand at the beginning of Adventism. There was an increase of knowledge at that time that brought a revival. There will be an increase of knowledge at the end of the world that brings a revival. It's not simply a coming to understand the books in rote memory or intellectually. There's a piece of information that's designed by God to drive you and me to the foot of the cross to surrender our idols that the Holy Spirit might abide in us and bring us back to life and finish this work so we can go home with him. That's the purpose and role of Bible prophecy. The experience is the 1888 experience. But we'll never get there until we'll acknowledge that we need to be awakened. When the books of Daniel and Revelation are better understood, believers will have an entirely different religious experience. She doesn't say she, we will have an entirely different intellectual understanding. There's something in the books of Daniel and Revelation that have been designed by God to bring about a different religious experience. How's your religious experience? How many of our families are where they should be today? What kind of influence um, are we having with our religious experience? Brothers and sisters, we're at the end of the world. You know, there was for, when you do Bible prophecy, and some of you have been following our ministry for many years. So I, I, I'm, in this school, I, I hesitate. <laughs> it makes you feel uncomfortable about saying things that you've been saying for many years when I know all of you out there have heard it from me before. Uh, but one of the things that we deal with in Bible prophecy is current events. And one of the themes of current events that, we, that I've spent time with is, is Pat Robertson and the Christian Coalition. And uh, I've tracked... I've tracked uh, what he's did and, and the goals he set. And uh, a couple years ago when Kathy and I uh, went to the, not this re last year, but a couple years ago when we went to the Christian Coalition meeting, I remembered that for a couple years I'd been out telling people what the goals of Pat Robertson were. were. But I had been so long since I looked at the actual current events, I often, when I would be telling people, I thought, Am, am I overemphasizing that? Was he, did he really say that, or am I adding a little bit to it? 
And what I would say is this, is that Pat Robertson has very clearly said that he does not believe there's a wall of separation of church and state in the Constitution and the Christian coalition has been raised up to remove that wall of separation of church and state. That's the number one stated goal of the Christian coalition. He said that he had a goal that by the election of uh, 1995, they wanted um, members of the Christian coalition in every voting precinct in uh, the United States, and they met that goal, and the first goal was that they wanted to take control of the Congress, and they did it in 1995, and his second goal is they wanted to put a president in the, in the White House, and they did that in the year 2000. What was, his, what was his next goal? Well, his next goal was this. When we were at the Christian Coalition a couple of years ago, number one, all those goals that I'd been saying about him in his speech that night, he went over every one of them. Right then and there, he confirmed it that yes, I hadn't been exaggerating. He doesn't believe in a wall of separation of church and state and the purpose of the Christian coalition is to remove it. And the first thing that they wanted to do was take control of the Congress. The second thing they wanted to do was put a president in the office. And what was the next thing they wanted to do? They wanted to secure the Supreme Court. And brothers and sisters, it got secured five days ago. Because everyone knows, everyone believes, now there's a possibility it won't happen, but everyone knows that right now George Bush is sitting in the place where over the next four years he's going to put up to maybe three judges in the Supreme Court. And at that, it's already balanced the wrong way, but at that point, the door is closed. The door is closed. So, I mean, look around. How's your Christian experience? Do you realize that we're at the end of the world? We're at the end of the world. Whatever may be man's intellectual advancement, let him not for a moment think that there is no need of thorough and continuous searching of the scriptures for greater light. As a people, we are called individually to be students of prophecy. Everyone in this room is required to be a student of prophecy. We're required to be familiar with, with the history, the rules, the purpose, the role of Bible prophecy. And in this room, maybe, maybe most of us are. But generally, when you're in an Adventist church and you're sharing a message like this, the reality of it is not very many of them seem familiar with Bible prophecy. And those that are familiar with Bible prophecy usually have some really strange ideas about what Bible prophecy is all about. We're asleep. Here we are required to be students of prophecy. And we're not, by and large. And yet this prophecy is the way the Lord says we're going to be awakened. And we're not even attempting to understand it. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 agrees with that statement. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be, to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Myself, I'm familiar with the material that we're going to attempt to get through here this week. I've went through it many times, and it's always a blessing for me when I go through it, so I'm not, I don't have a problem going through it over and over again. I like doing it. Um, but from the experience where we've had prophecy schools in the past, one of the, the most important parts of the presentations, just to forewarn you, and maybe it won't work here, but usually the dynamics of these prophecy schools work this way, is in the evening meetings, if you looked at your bulletin, the question and answer period. So I would encourage you, as we go through, we can't, we can't interrupt the meetings uh, with questions just from the floor because it's, it's being videotaped, but you have a question, write it down. Write it down, save it, and, and in the question and answer periods, we'll try to answer it. And usually, uh, those are some of the most interesting presentations. That may be different, but I'm looking forward to those as much as anything else, and uh, we'll see how that goes. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. As you go through this material... There's a lot of points we're going to make here, and as you're listening here at the very outset, you may be saying, yes, I understand that verse, and yes, I've read that before, and, but because particularly here at the beginning, we're trying to identify a few rules, a few concepts, a few principles, you may be thinking to yourself, how do these things connect? And what I want to forewarn you here, or not forewarn you, or encourage you to keep following on, is that most of these things that we're passing by very quickly, they'll begin to impact our study as we move forward. There's a lot of things you can put into this presentation, uh, but there really isn't enough time. And you find that, I find that what's in here 
is what needs to be in here as we move forward. So these passages, they have bearing as we move forward. We don't have time to elaborate on that bearing right now. So, uh, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rise in your heart, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. If you've been out sharing Bible prophecy, and you've interacted with the brethren on Bible prophecy, you come to find over a period of time that there's a lot of private interpretations out there. And brothers and sisters, we, we don't need those. We, we, can't, we can't afford to have those. We have to be sure about what prophecy is. And the only way that we can be sure about what prophecy is, what it's teaching, what it means, is by the Word of God. It's by the Word of God. We have to establish it by God's Word. Inspiration has to establish it, not man's word. And I'm telling you that out front for me. Don't listen to what I'm saying. <laughs> Don't listen to what I'm saying. Take note of what I'm saying. And compare it in your own study, in your, your prayer life, in, with God's word, with the spirit of prophecy, and see if it's sound. Compare it with the current events that are going on around us. Sister White says we should study the current events that are going on around us and compare them with the predictions of God's word in order to know where we are at. And where we're at is the end of the world. And at the end of the world, Amos 3.7, at the end of the world, is the Lord going to bring God's people to the end of the world without forewarning them about what's going to take place at the end of the world? Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. Brothers and sisters, I believe the Lord intends to uh, let the children of light understand what's taking place for their own protection, also in order for them to give a clear warning message. And I also believe that that experience is part of the sealing process. The, the understanding, the unfolding of prophecy, the, the, what it brings into a person's experience as they come to understand it and recognize um, that it is true and proclaim it to them around them is the very foundation of the sealing process that takes place with God's people at the end of time. Some people don't believe that in Adventism. But I think it's sound. I think we'll, we'll show that as we move forward. Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Selected Messages, Book 2, page 114. The more fully we accept the light presented by the Holy Spirit through the consecrated servants of God, the deeper and surer even as the eternal throne will appear the truths of ancient prophecy. We shall be assured that men of God spake as they were moved upon by the Holy Spirit. Men must themselves be under the influence of the Holy Spirit in order to understand the Spirit's utterances through the prophets. These messages were given not for those that uttered the prophecies, but for us who are living amid the scenes of their fulfillment. Yeah, I had a brother um, at a meeting in Oklahoma about, it's November, that was in April, wasn't it? March, March okay, eight or nine months ago, whatever that is. And uh, he gave me an understanding of 1 Corinthians 10, 11 I'd never heard before, but it, it explained a lot of his resistance to what I was saying. And I realized, hey, there is two ways to understand 1 Corinthians 10, 11. 1 Corinthians 10, 11 says, Now all these things happen un unto them as examples for those that are living at the end of the world. And he said to me, Yes, they are moral examples. Those histories in the Bible are teaching moral lessons about how you and I are supposed to live at the end of the world. But they're not setting forth histories that are illustrating the end of the world. Brothers and sisters, I disagree with him. I believe the Bible, the history of the Bible, is setting forth an illustration of the events that take place at the end of time. They're not, it's also giving us moral lessons of how we are to live without a doubt. Daniel in the lion's den is giving us moral lessons of how to live at the end of the world. Um, the fall of Babylon, when Daniel's called in before Belshazzar to read the handwriting on the world, wall, is giving us moral lessons on how we are to live. But those are also illustrations of the end of the world, what takes place at the end. I think they're both. 
And I think the prophets were speaking about the end of the world. Evangelism 196, ministers should present the sure word of prophecy as the foundation of the faith of Seventh-day Adventists. How many people, how many people in Adventism believe in righteousness by faith? This quote, uh, and there are several quotes like this, that says the foundation of the faith of Seventh-day Adventists is the sure word of prophecy. Is there a difference between righteousness by faith and this foundation of our faith? I don't think so. I think the righteousness by faith that, that corresponds with the 1888 message, um, justification, sanctification, however you want to articulate it, is based upon the foundation of Adventism, which is God's prophetic word. I think we'll show that, and I hope we'll show that in this prophecy school. Signs of the Times, June 2nd, 1898, the word of God, just as it reads, is the ground of our faith. That word is the sure word of prophecy, and it demands implicit faith from all who claim to believe it. It is authoritative, containing in itself the proof of its divine origin. Have you ever found something in God's prophetic word and suddenly you realize this is God speaking to you? I've come across things like that. I've come across them, and so I've, I've got a little personal terminology when I see some of those things. I, I call it God's signature. I've seen things in prophecy that I realize only God could put that there. He's put his signature on it. It demands faith when you see it. It demands faith. Yeah, and if without it, uh, we don't see it. Desire of Ages, 796. Beginning at Moses, the very alpha of Bible history, Christ expounded in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Had he first made himself known to them, their hearts would have been satisfied. In the fullness of their joy, they would have hungered for nothing more. But it was necessary for them to understand the witness borne to him by the types and the prophecies of the Old Testament. Upon these... Their faith must be established. Christ performed no miracle to convince them, but it was his first work to explain the scriptures. They had looked upon his death as the destruction of all their hopes. Now he showed from the prophets that th this was the very strongest evidence for their faith. Definition of prophecy. Now, th this passage doesn't say this is the definition of prophecy, but this is a very good definition of prophecy. And this is an important one to, to dissect, in my mind, very carefully. Th this, she's talking about how William Miller and the Millerites um, set forth prophecy in that time period. And in ex sharing that, she says, Hic historical events showing the direct fulfillment of prophecy were set before the people and prophecy was seen to be a figurative delineation of events leading down to the close of this earth's history. And I'd like to take the time to dissect uh, that particular statement. And uh, let's begin with um, historical events. The first thing she said there is that it's historical events that de demonstrate the fulfillment of prophecy. It's not a philosophical concept that fulfills prophecy. It's a historical event. And William Miller and the pioneers, that's how they proved to the world that prophecy was fulfilling. They took historical events that had taken place and saying, here's the prophecy, here's the historical event, and the people sat up and listened. James White, um, very simple statement, but I, I like this statement. This is James White, other people have said similar things, but prophecy is history in advance. You can't separate history from prophecy. That's what it is. In that passage where she says historical events were set before the people and prophecy was seen to be a figurative delineation of events, this dictionary is, that we're quoting from is the dictionary of Sister White's day and age. She made this statement. And delineation means to set forth up on a line. means to illustrate something on a line. But there's more in that little statement. She says it was a figurative delineation. In figurative from that same dictionary, representing something else, represented by resemblance, typical, representing by resemblance, not literal or direct. Sister White says, prophecy was seen to be a figurative delineation of events. Brothers and sisters, this, in my mind, is something we need to understand, and we're going to deal with this a lot. We're going to give you an example of one of the things that we'll deal with, a history. Prophecy is demonstrated by history. One history we will deal with a lot in this prophecy school is the history of 1840 to 44, the pioneer time period. It was a history 
that was fulfilled. There were specific events that took place in those years that were historical events, but they were figurative. They were prefiguring what takes place at the end of the world. They were they took place right then and there, literally, but they were also prefiguring the end of the world. Prophecy was seen to be figurative delineation of events leading down to the close of this earth's history. Prophecy is also going to the end of the world. It has a specific direction. Um, in between our, our opening remarks in this presentation, briefly we were talking up here about a little bit of Bible, Bible, Bible prophecy. And one of the points that, that I was trying to make uh, in that brief conversation was that there's a statement, there's several places where Sister White teaches this, but there's a plain statement, and I think we even have it in our notes, we'll get to it um, somewhere in this week, where she says, the prophecies lead down to the opening, all the prophecies lead down to the opening of the judgment. That's the focus point of end time Bible prophecy, is the judgment time period. In the judgment time period, you have to factor in that Sister White said shortly after 1844 that if those people that were proclaiming uh, the midnight cry message had unitedly followed on by faith, God's people would have been in heaven shortly after 1844. How could they have been in heaven shortly after 1844? How could that have happened? How could the papacy arose uh, back into power? And how could the United States, in, in the power that it had in 1844, have the power to force the world to worship the beast? doesn't seem reasonable, but that's the truth of Bible prophecy. Sister White says we could have finished the work in that time period, and she kept saying it as the years unfolded. 1888, the Lord was trying to pull out, pour out the latter rain, and she says when the latter rain comes, it will, come as fire, it will go as fire in the stubble. So he was ready to finish it then, but time drags on. The point is, the point of reference for Bible prophecy, it leads down to the opening of the judgment, but it gets drug out for a long period of time. Why? Because of disobedience of God's people. But did, did God not know that was going to take place? Yes. Yeah. So, so he's given the clear picture of the end of the world, but the, the Focal point of Bible prophecy brings down the judgment. That needs to be factored down. Now all these things happened unto them for examples and they're written for our admonition upon whom the end of the world are come. 1 Corinthians 10, 11, one of the most important um, verses for Bible prophecy study. We'll do with that a lot uh, this weekend. This week, Acts of the Apostle 585. In the Revelation, all the books of the Bible meet and end. Here is the complement of the book of Daniel. One is the prophecy, the other a revelation. The book that was sealed is not the revelation, but that portion of the prophecy of Daniel relating to the last days. Um, brothers and sisters, if you were going to deal with end time Bible prophecy, the book in the Bible that most clearly portrays the end of the world is the book of Revelation. You can't separate Daniel out of it, but that's where uh, all the Bible testimony comes together is in the book of Revelation. But also Sister White here says that the book of Daniel, the book of Revelation, they complement one another. This complement is with an E, it's not with an I. The word complement with an I means when you tell someone they look very nice or they did a very good job. This complement is with an E. Ement, ement. And with an E, it means to bring to perfection. It's say, Sister White is saying that the books of Daniel and Revelation bring each other to perfection. They must be studied together. Each of the ancient prophets spoke less for our, their own time than for ours, so that their prophesying is in force for us. Now all these things happened unto them for ensamples, and they're written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Not unto themselves, but unto us did they minister the, the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. The Bible has accumulated and bound up together its treasures for this last generation. All the great events and solemn transactions of Old Testament history have been and are repeating themselves in the church in the last days. Brothers and sisters, Inspiration is teaching us that the testimony of God's word is being fulfilled at the end of the world.
The work of a student of prophecy is to take the prophetic passages of God's Word that are recorded here and correctly bring them down to the end of the world. And, I, and I'm emphasizing correctly. You can't, we can't just bring them and throw them down to the end of the world and not align them correctly to where they agree with the other prophets. The prophets must agree um, with one another. Selected Messages, Book 3. These men of the Old Testament spoke of things transpiring in their day, and Daniel, Isaiah, and Ezekiel not only spoke of things that concerned them as present truth, but their sight reached down to the future and to what should occur in the last days. The prophets were speaking about the last days. 1 Corinthians 14.32 I know this is a familiar verse to you all, but if you haven't really stopped and think, thought about it, you may, not, you may have read through it. It says, in the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. It means the prophets agree with one another. The prophets aren't going to, one prophet isn't going to be telling a story about the end of the world, and another prophet's telling a story about the end of the world, and those stories are disagreeing with one another. But it's not necessarily simple to bring their testimony together because they're speaking in prophetic symbols. That's the work of a student of prophecy. How do we bring the prophetic testimonies together? We know they agree, but we may not understand the agreement because we're not familiar with the symbols. That's our work as a student of prophecy. And all of us have been called to be a student of prophecy. Waymarks. We sang, sang a song about Waymarks today. Um, Selected Messages, Book 2, page 101 and 102. The great way marks of truth showing us our bearings in prophetic history are to be carefully guarded lest they be torn down and replaced with theories that would bring confusion rather than light. And uh, the definition for waymark is a, a mark to guide in traveling. It's a mark along the way. A waymark is a mark along the way. And the historical events that have unfolded in prophetic history are marks along the way and we can't move those and brothers and sisters in Adventism today many of the way marks of Adventism people attempt to move them all the time all the time we can't we've been warned that people would attempt to do it but we have to know what they are and we have to be able to, to defend why they um, should be understood in the history where they where they arrive they show us our bearing and the word bearing it's talking about the situation of an object. Waymarks. If we're defining, we're still defining prophecy. Remember, Sister White said in a quote about six quotes ago, prophecy was seen to be a figurative delineation of events leading down to the close of this earth's history. She says that William Miller and the pioneers set before the people historical events that were, were demonstrating the fulfillment of prophecy. William Miller, the pioneers. They, on a timeline leading down to the end of the world, they would set forth historical events. Um, they would talk about the deadly wound of the papacy in 1798, the falling of the stars in 1833, the collapse of the Ottoman Empire in 1840. These were historical events on a timeline leading down to the end of the world. And these historical events are also figurative. Figurative. They're not, just this, it's not simply this history. The, the deadly wound of the papacy that took place in 1798 is also prefiguring the final destruction of the papacy at the end of the world when the, when the king of the north comes to his end, none shall help. These, these histories prefigure the end of the world. Now I know there's a lot of people that take prophecy and they reapply at the end of the world and they do it incorrectly. But nevertheless, um, the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 was a historical event that was a fulfillment of Bible prophecy, but Sister White clearly says the destruction of Jerusalem does what? It represents the end of the world. Historical events are these waymarks that Sister White says must be carefully guarded. These are the waymarks of Bible prophecy. And we're going to deal with waymarks um, in depth as we go through, but in that passage it says they're showing us our bearing in prophetic history, and this word bearing, it means the situation of an object with respect to another object by which it is supposed to have a connection or with it or influences upon it. Let me show you some prophetic history where it's very simple to see what she means by bearing. 
When did the first angel's message arrive in history? Anyone? This is a pro prophecy school. This is not a sermon. 1843. Incorrect. 1840. We will prove that later from inspiration if we're not familiar with that passage. When did the second angel's message come into history? 1842. We will show that later, at least two passages in inspiration. When did the third angel's message come into history? 1844. Here's the, the third angel's message, second angel's message, first angel's message. These were historical events. We're setting them before the people on a timeline leading down to the end of the world. But these are way marks and they have bearings on one another. Does the first angel's message have any connection to the second angel's message? Second angel's message have a connection to the third angel's message? That's what Sister White is saying. These way marks, we don't just have to understand where they came into history. We need to understand how they relate to the other historical events that are unfolding. And brothers and sisters... They're a figurative delineation of events, and in this, this time period where these three messages came into history, we had the fulfillment of the parable of the ten virgins, and Sister White says it will be fulfilled again to the very letter, so these historical events were prefiguring the end of the world. They're a, fig, pre, a figurative delineation of events leading down to the close of this earth's history, and they have, these way marks have a bearing upon each other. Review and Herald, July 31st. 1888, we must have a knowledge of the scriptures that we may trace down the lines of prophecy. What comes to your mind when you hear me emphasizing the lines of prophecy? Line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. We must understand the lines of prophecy if we can bring line upon line. If we don't understand those lines of prophecy, how can we bring the line upon line together? We must have a knowledge of the scriptures that we may trace down the lines of prophecy and understand the specifications given by the prophets and by Christ and the apostles that we may not be ignorant but be able to see that the day is approaching. Brothers and sisters, we must be able to see that the day is approaching. Do you see it approaching? So that with increased zeal and effort we may exhort one another to faithfulness, piety, and holiness. And I hope in a meeting like this that we understand what we mean by holiness. We mean that when the Sunday law arrives, those people that receive the seal of God, they're from that point on going to go into a time period when they stand without an intercessor for prayer and they must have all sin out of their experience or they will be incapable of standing during that time. If you believe that we can sin until Jesus comes, you destroy the third angel's message. What difference does it make about the mark of the beast if you can keep Sunday when that Sunday law arrives? If you can't keep Sunday, it means it's demanding obedience in that testing time. It means that we have to have holiness by that time. So we're, we're talking in a level here on Adventist study that is a step above any foolishness about the, the idea that we can hold on to sin and be among the 144,000. Prophecy calls people to holiness. Isaiah 29, 9-13 Whom shall he teach knowledge and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people, to whom he said, This is the rest herewith you may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing. Yet they would not hear. But the word of the Lord was unto them precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. We must have a knowledge of the prophetic line. Because line upon line, precept upon precept, this type of Bible study is what? What is it? It's the refreshing. And what's the refreshing? The refreshing is the blotting out of sin. It's the latter rain. It's the seal of God. It's the message of Christ's righteousness. 
The same line of prophecy. In the book of Revelation, the same line of prophecy is taken up as in Daniel. When we begin to share Daniel 11 with you, I hope that one of the tests that you take, I hope you test everything we share. And I hope you, when you hear uh, that I'm putting the wrong emphasis or teaching something in area, I, I hope that you um, approach me with it and straighten it out. But as we go through this study, one of the tests that should go through your mind is what you're hearing here about the book of Daniel does that agree with what you find in the book of Revelation? Because if it doesn't, that's a giant warning flag that something's not right. Something's off. In the book of Revelation, the same line of prophecy is taken up as in Daniel. Some, prophecy God, some prophecies God has repeated, thus showing that importance must be given to them. The Lord does not repeat things that are no, of no great consequence. Very important principle in my mind. Selected Messages, Book 2, page 114. Prophecy has been fulfilling line upon line. The more firmly we stand under the banner of the third angel's message, the more clearly shall we understand the prophecy of Daniel, for the revelation is the supplement of Daniel. Brothers and sisters, what does it mean to stand under the banner of the third angel's message? I mean, you can, you can get some very good speakers up here that it can explain the, the correct gospel salvation story that has been encoded and placed in the three angels messages and that is true that is true and you can get up and you can explain how the the first second third angels message is a historical event that's true also you can address it from what it's teaching about the gospel you can address it from what it's teaching about history or you can address it from what it's prophetically symbolizing, but there is some way, according to inspiration, that we can stand under the banner of the third angel's message that allows us to do what? To understand Bible prophecy. And I would submit to you that the banner of the third angel's message that inspiration is pointing us to here has more to do with the prophetic significance of the first, second, and third angel's message than it does um, with the everlasting gospel. It does not deny the everlasting gospel. It doesn't deny it. But I would submit to you that the three angels' message followed by the fourth is actually the pattern for end time Bible prophecy and we'll get to that as we move forward. This is one of the quotes that goes with that study. Select the message of book 2114 continuing on. The more fully we accept the light presented by the Holy Spirit through the consecrated servants of God, the deeper and surer, even as the eternal throne will appear the truths of ancient prophecy. Notice that when I'm trying to emphasize this about the banner of the third angel's message, what Sister White here is, she's not emphasizing that the judgment began in 1844, or she's not emphasizing a call out of Babylon, and she's not talking about the mark of the beast. She's talking about that there's some way that the third angel's message sheds light upon ancient prophecy. It's about prophecy in this passage. Will appear the truths of ancient prophecy. We shall be assured that men of God spake as they were moved upon by the Holy Ghost. Men must themselves be under the influence of the Holy Spirit in order to understand the Spirit's utterances through the prophets. It was my idea to have two books bound together, Revelation following Daniel, as giving fuller light on the subjects dealt with in Daniel. The object is to bring these books together, showing that they both relate to the same subjects. Daniel and Revelation relate to the same subjects. Example. Example, if you'll receive it. Some people teach in Adventism, unfortunately, that in Revelation 17, five have fallen, one is, and one is yet to come. There's seven popes that have taken place in history since 1929, the Lateran Treaty. Show it to me in the book of Daniel. Showing that they both relate to the same subjects. There's got to be an agreement between these books. That's an argument that we need to bring to bear when someone is going to stand before us and teach us something from the books of Daniel and Revelation. Is, are they agreeing with each other? They're the same book. The proclamation of the first and second and third angel's message have been located. There's much that Sister White says about these messages, but notice what she's emphasizing in this passage as she does in others. She's talking about where they arrived in history have been located by the word of inspiration. Not a peg or pin is to be removed. No human authority has any more right to change the location of these messages than to substitute the New Testament for the Old. All that God has in prophetic history specified to be fulfilled in the past has been, and all that is yet to come in its order will be. 
Prophecy has a specific order. We're going to deal with that. When we're, when we're taking a line of prophecy and bringing it down to the end of the world, we may find that this particular line of prophecy has three way marks on it. Three historical events on that line of prophecy. And we bring it down to the end of the world and we line it up with a line of prophecy. And we line it up correctly, but the one we overlay it with has ten way marks. That's okay. That's okay that this prophet only told us three way marks and this prophet told us ten. It's okay if they fit together, but if we bring them together and there's a different sequence, can't be. Because prophecy has a specific order. The, the warning flag that we need to keep premier in our mind when we're bringing prophetic history together at the end of the world, one of the biggest warning flags is does the sequence of events that we're setting forth agree with the sequence of events that we're lining it up with. It's okay if it doesn't tell the complete same story, but the sequence should be the same every time because the spirit of the prophets are subject unto the prophets. In history and prophecy, the Word of God portrays the long-continued conflict between truth and error. That conflict is yet in progress. Those things which have been will be repeated. Study the Revelation in connection with Daniel, for history will be repeated. Brothers and sisters, prophecy and history will be repeated. That's something every student of prophecy must understand. Now, what we almost also must understand is that there is incorrect ways to reapply history and prophecy. But because there are incorrect ways to apply them and because there are people out there doing so should not discourage us from attempting to correctly understand how they are repeated. We read this, some prophecies God has repeated, thus showing that importance must be given to them. The Lord does not repeat things that are of no great consequence. We are standing on the threshold of great and solemn events. Many of the prophecies are about to be fulfilled in quick succession. Every element of power is about to be set at work. Past history will be repeated. Studied, study Revelation in connection with Daniel, for history will be repeated. As we near the close of this world's history, the prophecies relating to the last days especially demand our study. The last book of the New Testament scriptures is full of truth that we need to understand. Satan has blinded the minds of many so that they have been glad for any excuse for not making Revelation their study. The Bible has accumulated and bound together its treasures for this last generation. All the great events and solemn transactions of Old Testament history have been and are repeating themselves in the church in these last days. There the whole accumulated truths are presented and forced to us that we may profit from their teachings. Select the messages, book 2, 109. All that God has in prophetic history specified to be fulfilled in the past has been and all that is yet to come in its order will be. Councils of Writers and Editors 28 and 29. Another important truth. A truth, I mean if you're reading, if you're familiar with the pioneers and you're reading this quarter Sabbath school lessons, brothers and sisters, this particular uh, point of reference is not factored in to this Sabbath school because lessons because they're opposing the pioneers in there. It says, God has given me light regarding our periodicals. What is it? He's, he has said that the dead are to speak. How? The works shall follow them. We are to repeat, repeat the words of the pioneers in our work who knew what it cost to search for truth is for hidden treasure and who had labored to lay the foundation of our work. They move forward step by step under the influence of the Spirit of God. One by one these pioneers are passing away. The word given me let the, that which these men have written in the past be reproduced. Let the truths that are the foundation of our faith be kept before the people. We are now to understand what the pillars of our faith are, the truths that have made us as a people what we are, leading us on step by step. Amen. Jeremiah 6.16 6, Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths where is the good way and walk therein and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said... We will not walk therein. And they that shall be of thee shall build up the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. Brothers and sisters, in our sleepiness, 
most of us, it seems, in Adventism have very little understanding of what the pioneers came to understand, understand at the very beginning of their work, how they came to understand it, and how sound it was, and what great Bible students they were, and what great thinkers they were, and they're the ones that developed the foundation that we've been warned would come under attack as we approach the end. Running out of time, you have the notes. Uh, I like the one on the bottom, Proverbs 22, 28. Remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set up. And I would submit to you that many of them have been removed. There is a work of sacred importance for ministers and people to do. They are to study the history of the cause and people of God. They are not to forget the past dealings of God with his people. They are to revive and recount the truths that have seen, come to seem of little value to those who do not know by personal experience of the power and brightness that accompanied them when they were first seen and understood. In all their original freshness and power, these truths are to be given to the world. So, we're just getting started. Remember to write down the questions that pop into your mind. Uh, we may not be able to answer them, but we will take time as we go through to try. So as far as possible, uh, shall we kneel together? Heavenly Father, we thank you um, for bringing us here at the beginning of this um, study. Um, this is the hard day when uh, we've all been traveling and uh, very hectic getting started here, but uh, we know that you're with us. We know that we're at the end of time and that you want us to come to understand your prophetic word. And we ask that you would bless this school with your presence, with your Holy Spirit, and that you would bless us and uh, that part of that blessing would be that you would give us a good night's rest tonight. I know that we're, many of us are coming from completely different time zones. We ask that you'd get our body clocks uh, running together um, that we might participate and uh, take away from this encampment something that would help us uh, to better reflect your character and give this final warning message. And we thank you for the ease and the comfort that we have to come together and enter into this work. In Jesus' name, amen.